Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I do realize that I'm standing between you and your party, so I really do appreciate you spending this hour with me, and I'm hoping to, to make it uh, worth your while, and maybe um, make it as light as I can, even though it is a quite um, deep topic, I would say. So we're going to talk about debugging um, .NET applications. And um, I'm Tess. I used to work in ASP.NET support, debugging things for a living for both developers outside of Microsoft and also the product teams within Microsoft. So I'm a developer at Microsoft right now. And, and at the moment, I'm mostly debugging things for myself, sometimes for internal teams. But um, I'm going to talk to you about how to de debug like these uh, issues that are maybe a little bit um, out of the mainstream, and that's a little bit harder to debug than the newest step-by-step um, -step debugging. So we're going to talk about high memory usage, how do you tackle that, bad performance, crashes, and exceptions. What I'm going to talk about is applicable not only to .NET Core, but also to .NET Framework if you um, if you use that, but some tools will be .NET Core specific. So we're going to be debugging dumps. I hope you're ready for this. Um, and I do hope to make it um, as understandable as I can. The reason why we're using memory dumps to debug these kind of issues is because they are typically very, very hard to F5 debug. So you can't really step um, through them. They're also very often intermittent, and they happen on someone else's machine, maybe on someone else's, like on an operating system that's not your own. Um, and sometimes they happen in, in Azure or in the cloud somewhere, and then you have to have a way to, to troubleshoot it, even if you can't reproduce it locally. And then, apart from me is talking about how to debug that, I'm going to try to sprinkle in some .NET internals. But if you do have any questions along the way, feel free to shout it out. I know I'm, a, I'm asking that of a Norwegian crowd, and I'm Swedish myself, so I know that I'm not the type to do that. But do feel free to do that if you want to. Um, this is going to be a very demo-intensive uh, session. So from now on, I literally almost have no slides except for some, some things just to keep the, in the story going. But from here on, we're going to just look at uh, demos of how to troubleshoot this. And we're going to start off with high memory usage. And with high memory usage, the only thing that we really need to, to figure out when we're debugging one of these things is who's using up the memory and why is it not being returned? Why is it not going away? So, so what's the reason that we're using up the memory? We're going to start off with a high memory usage um, demo in Linux, and I, I'm doing this in Linux, and you can just as well do it on win, on like, uh, in a Windows session, but I'm doing it in Linux just to show you that the tools are very much the same, and you can use the same ones, whether it's Linux or um, Windows. So uh, I have an extremely simple memory leak, and I know people usually say that, but I'm going to show you how simple it is, because the point here that I'm trying to make is not necessarily for us to, to delve deep into like these very odd things, but to, to kind of get to know the tools first. So what we have here is, is just a console application where we loop through um, you know, 10,000 uh, times and add on a product to a list of products. So this is not necessarily a leak. This is just high memory usage. We're going to keep using more and more of these products. And the reason why it's not going away is because we have them in a static list. And as long as they are rooted in that static list, like the garbage collector can't reclaim it. And then if we want to do it once more, we'll leak, leak uh, 20,000 more objects. So now that you know what's going to go on and what we're going to be looking for, Let's see how this works. By the way, like a little raise of hand, um, who's used the dump before, or who's, who's debugged with it? OK, so quite a few. Cool. Uh, hopefully, I'll still <laughs> be able to teach you something new here. Um, so we're going to run that, that one console app that I showed you. So .NET to run. 
and let's wait for that to happen. So the first tool that I want to show you is a tool that comes with .NET Core, um, or that you can install with .NET Core. It's called .NET Counters. And .NET Counters is um, a tool that shows you performance counters. So in the old days, we used to have like Perfmon for viewing performance counters. In this case, we're going to show, um, so I'll show you what, what it shows. The first thing I need to do is, um, is just list the processes that I can monitor. And in this case, our simple memory leak is, um, has the process ID 6931. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do .NET counters monitor and dash P. 6931. Um, and this is going to show us some, um, some counters for the process, so some, um, some tracing or whatever you want to call it. As an example, it will show us how much memory we're using in megabytes. So we're using around 200 megabytes for these products. The reason why we're using so much is because I've inflated it by adding a character array that's um, by default very big to each of these products. So this um, tool, .NET Counters, which you can install with .NET install, um, helps us a little bit uh, to tell us if we're leaking uh, .NET code, or sorry, .NET objects, or if we're leaking, for example, native objects. And by native, I mean something that's like not .NET. Or um, maybe we're leaking um, DLLs, like assemblies. So and this would also be shown, uh, for example, in the number of assemblies loaded in here. As long as we see um, the GC heap size, which is the .NET heap, growing, it means that we're going to be looking for a problem um, among .NET objects. So we're going to go ahead and leak a little bit more and see that the um, heap size goes up by 200 more. So now we know for sure that we're going to be looking for a growth in .NET object memory. The next thing, so, so that's just sort of like to, to give us a, a little bit of an idea of where we stand and what we're trying to look at. The next tool I'm going to show you is a tool that you can also install with .NET install that's called .NET um, GC dump. So GC dump, um, what it is, is a tool that allows you to use, collect statistics of the .NET objects that are in the process. So we can do .NET GC dump collect. Actually, I need to, I can't remember <laughs> what the PID was. Um, so it was 6931. Um, so .NET GC dump collect dash P 6931. So this will just um, essentially collect statistics about all the .NET objects that are on there. And we can go ahead and open that in Visual Studio. Um, and this, what do, you, what do you get here is the same thing that you would get if you were to debug your process inside Visual Studio. And you know, there is like the di diagnostic tools window in Visual Studio, and you can take a snapshot. This is that snapshot. Um, not sure how well you can see this, but this gives us a list of all the .NET objects that are in the process. And the first thing, if we, if we go ahead and sort by count, is we see our product. So this is um, um, the product object. We have 20,000 of them. And they, by themselves, including the objects that they hold on to, like the characters, arrays, and everything, take up 402 megabytes. So that's a sizable amount of the 420, like the other is like a little bit negligible. So if we were to, to look at this process and try to figure out what's going on, we could just do a GC dump, look, and in this case, it's a very, very, um, like I would say, in this case, it's, it's clear that this is the problem. It might not always be like that, because obviously in a real process, you would be uh, also allocating a lot of other things. So you might have to look a little bit deeper before you see the culprit. It's not going to be this obvious. But it will often actually be this easy to, to determine which type of objects you might be leaking. And if we click on this, we get, um, we get a little thing down here, which is the root chain. So I'm 
I'm going to go and go over in PowerPoint and show you this zoomed in in a moment. But if you go through and click on these, they will show you the root chain for for each of them. So, what do I mean by root chain? I mean that um, for each one of these, it tells you, um, in this case, 19,999 of the 20,000 are in fact rooted in a list of products. So the reason why they are sticking around, the reason why they can't be collected, is because they are actually contained in a list of products. And unless you remove them from the list, they will not go away. So this is how simple it can be to troubleshoot a memory leak. Now, again, like I said, if this was a bigger process, you might have to look a little bit deeper before you get to the, the products. But um, it's not going to be terribly uh, much more than this to debug a memory leak. We could, if we wanted to, also go one step further and, um, and debug this as a memory dump. So let's see, let's go back to um, uh, this. And instead of .NET GC dump, we would do .NET dump. This is another tool um, that you can download and install from .NET. And this now, instead of used to giving us the statistics of the objects, it gives us a full memory dump. So this is a snapshot of the process as it was when we captured the dump. Uh, I'm going to close down a few of these to give us some more space to look at what this means. So, so this is typically what you would pull up in WinDBG. So this is, is one way to capture a memory dump that you can open up in WinDBG. But you can also open it up inside .NET dump. So we can do um, here .NET dump analyze. And it's usually called core something on Linux, or it's called something dump on, on Windows. Let me kind of silence <laughs> my team. Um, yeah, so uh, I've opened up the memory dump, and now I can run a few commands. And um, I'm going to be running commands, and you're going to be going like, OK, how am I going to remember that? Don't, don't worry about having to remember it. I'll show you some links that will show you and that will give you enough information to, to remember all the commands. Um, once you open up the, the memory dump, you can, though, write help, or you can write blah, or you can write anything that is not a command, and it will show you all the commands that you can use in this process. One of these commands is called E version. So EE, in this case, stands for execution engine, which is the whole CLR, like the whole .NET, like .NET runtime. An E version is used to command that we can run to understand sort of like what, what the .NET framework version is, a couple of things, like for example, in this case, we're running something called workstation mode, which is one version of the garbage collector that you will run in command line um, or anything that's not a server, anything that's not bombarded by requests, we usually run the workstation version. And then there is a server version, which is geared towards um, web applications, for example, that get bombarded with requests where each one of the processors on your machine uh, can garbage collect at the same time. You don't necessarily have to worry about this a whole lot, but this is the information you get here. The next thing we can do is we can run a command called eheap, so execution engine heap. And what this will show us is how much memory we're using in the, like how much memory we're using in the process, and specifically how much memory goes to .NET objects. And we'll see in here that it's a total of 406, which was the same thing we saw with the counters. It also gives us some information about the um, the segment, and I'll get to what the segments and everything are in just a second. But for right now, I want to show you. Uh, how how you would uh, and how you would troubleshoot the memory leak, which is you would do you would run a command called dump heap stat, which shows all the in, like the .NET heap in statistical format. So this is exactly what you saw in in the Visual Studio case with GC dump, which lists all the object and the statistics for them, and you can see, for example, here too that we have 20,000 product objects. Okay. So typically, when you have a memory leak 
or a memory, you can't really necessarily leak .NET memory. You can just use it and forget why you used it, but you cannot, uh, like it's not like C++ where you can allocate something and then never be able to deallocate it again. Um, when you look at a list like this and it gives you the statistics, um, there are a couple of things that you need to think about when you try to figure out which things should I look at and which things shouldn't I look at. So you'll see at the bottom, for example, that we have a lot of strings and a lot of character arrays, and these take up a lot of memory. Trying to debug all the different strings and why they stay around, that's a futile mission. Like, you will never get there, because the process is always going to use a lot of strings and a lot of arrays. And in fact, the way it works in .NET, if I go ahead and, and run a command called um, dump heap mt, which is dump, dump everything with a certain method table. A method table is an identifier for your object. So it dumps out all these uh, product objects. You'll see that all of them are 40 bytes. So any object, um, like for example, like a class like this um, product, is never going to be very big, because the only space it takes up is the, um, you know, like the pointers to its member variables. But it can never be, for example, 1K, even if whatever it points to is 1K. However, things like strings, like the string takes up whatever size the string is. The array takes up whatever size the array is. So strings and, and arrays, they will always end up at the bottom. So you can clearly, you can ignore them and instead go straight for, like look a little bit further up in the list and think, okay, so what do I see there that's maybe mine, that's maybe custom, that looks out of place? For example, is it realistic for this process to use up 20,000 products? And once you've done that, and you, you dump out like, the products like this, you can then go in and pick one of them um, and, and run gc root. So gc root will do exactly what, um, what, the other, um, what the other tool, like what Visual Studio was doing, showing you, I need to uh, make them shut up. <laughs> like why, why is my team working at this hour? Um, so GC root will show you what was at the bottom of the Visual Studio output for, for the GC dump. Like it will essentially in this case say that this particular product is enclosed in a product array, which is the implementation for, for a product list. And this particular uh, product list is then in use on a thread. So this is why it's sticking around. And this is the, a little bit the end of the road for this investigation. We've already sort of determined why, uh, what the problem is. Okay, so, um, uh, so we've used .NET counters, we used .NET dump, we'd used .NET GC dump, and these are all tools that are are easy to install both locally and, and if you're running on, on a server somewhere. If you want to understand sort of like, if you want to do this at home, um, you can go in on, on my blog, which is www.testforandus.com. There is like a lot, yeah, I'll get to you in a second. Um, there's a lot of labs. A lot of what I'm talking about here is in lab, so you can actually run them and, and try out all these commands and also um, understand what all these commands mean and what the output means and all that stuff. Yes? So uh, the dumps you have, is it possible with the tools to compare them to see the difference? Uh, you mean, for example, like to, um, to take one snapshot and then another one? Yes. So um, with the memory dump, the one you took with, uh, .NET dump, um, then you have to compare it manually. Then you would have to open one and then another. But um, in Visual Studio, there is an option to, to do compare with, and then you can browse for each another snapshot. So you can do GC dump twice 
you know, and making whatever it, it takes for you to reproduce it in between. And it will then sh show you like which ones, the diff that was, um, that was biggest, so to speak. So you can sort it by diff in that case. So good question. Um, yes, so um, let's have a look at the memory layout and like how, how things looked in, in the memory dump. So if we look at this eheap-gc, um, we can then go ahead and dump out, for example, one segment. So I'll get to the segment in just a second. Dump heap. So we'll just dump it out from one address uh, to another. And we'll see that in .NET, the way it works, um, instead of like in C++, and, and this is actually true not only for .NET, but also for Python or for any, generally anything that has a garbage collector will work fairly similarly. So instead of you allocating um, yeast, the memory needed for your specific object, the garbage collector allocates a big chunk of memory called a segment. And in this segment, it then places your object one after another, like tightly. First one object, and the next, and then the next, and then the next. And sometimes in between, you'll have like these free objects um, just to align them um, a little bit to, to nice addresses. So in this case, we have our product, um, this 44 one is probably a string, and the, in this 200 or 20k uh, one is probably the character array. I happen to know this because I know how big they are, but you could, for example, dump out this object to understand what it was. So the nice thing about that it's laid out like this is that it allows us to then enumerate and give, get these statistics and things like that. So what we're seeing here with dump heap stat and everything that we can run here is a result of um, when I used to work in, in ASP.NET support, we... Does anyone know how to, how to silence this? I should know this working where I work. This one is to quit, I guess. Yes. Um, you don't need to see this. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so when I worked in ASP.NET support, then um, we needed to troubleshoot these kind of things, and, and the product team for, for .NET back then had this uh, nice tool, but very rudimentary, that, that was called Strike. So back in the day, .NET had two, um, two parts. It was DNA and Lightning, which was essentially the common language runtime and then the base class libraries. And in order to debug this, they had this tool called Strike, this extension called Strike, because of Strike the Lightning. So what we did in support together with the, with the ASP.NET product team was we, generate, we created a, a tool called SOS. And you might have tried this if you worked with memory dumps. Um, and you th might think that this SOS stands for save our souls. And it sure has saved my soul maybe uh, one, once or twice. But it's, um, it actually stands for son of strike. So son of strike then we generated, or like where we created all these commands like dump heap and everything to, to be able to enumerate them. But, and, and that's also what's made it into to this. Um, but this is sort of like the reason why we could do this. And, and this is also... Um, something that could be done, for example, in other managed languages. Uh, if we look at this again, um, oh, e-gc, um, we'll see that these are sort of like a fixed size, and when you run out of them, you get more and more of them. And we have something called the large object heap, where we store very large object, but I'll get to that in a second, too. If you want to know more about like how this allocation works and, and sort of like go deeper into performance issues with allocation and things like that, and this is a good uh, place to, to look. So this is Maoni, who's the architect of the the garbage collector. Um, it's her little brain dump of of what's going on. And also on my blog, I have plenty of um, information about how the garbage collector works and things like that. So the reason 
why we would have a memory leak in .NET or, or why we would use up a lot of memory. Because we can't leak things, it means that they must be rooted. And we've seen a couple of routes. We've seen sort of like the, the list that was on the thread. In this case, it was actually also a static list. Um, so static objects, they stay around. Um, cache, which is used a subset of statics. Or pinned objects, if you pin something, then um, it won't be garbage collected until it's unpinned. And finally, uh, something called the finalizer queue. So let's have a look at another memory leak um, and how to troubleshoot it that happens to be uh, rooted in something slightly different. So in this case, I've captured a memory dump, and I'm going to be using um, WinDBG instead. So WinDBG is a native debugger that you can download from the Windows Store, or you can also download it separately if you want to. And this is um, a tool that you can also debug, not GC dump, but dump uh, full dumps. So let's see, open up. Um, here, so .NET dump is one way to create a memory dump. You can also generate memory dumps by right-clicking in Task Manager, create dump, or you can and do it with, for example, with proc dump, or there's a lot, a lot of different tools that you can use to capture dumps. So in this case, we're going to go through the exact same things, but in this case in WinDBG. So in this case, we're going to actually use the SOS.dll. And the only difference between this and the other one is, well, there are a couple of differences. In this one, you can run a few more commands that you can't in the other one. You can run commands like native commands that show the, the call stack and things like that. And um, you, have to, you have to use exclamation mark before because we're using a DLL. So we can still run a version. In this case, we see that it's instead server mode because this is taken from a, a web server. Um, with two GC heaps, so one heap per, um, per processor on the machine. And we can run ee heap dash gc, and we'll see now that instead of one, we get two heaps, um, and that the total, um, total use is around 340 megs in this case. So we want to understand why we're using up this much memory. And just like in the other one, we can then run dump heap uh, stat to get the statistics. And you'll see that you get this um, sort of like blue link underneath it. So this is something called debugger markup language, which makes your life a little bit easier. Because instead of having to run the commands, you can just click on the links and it will run the commands for you. So in this case, again, if we go from the bottom, we'll see that, OK, so we have some character arrays, we have some byte arrays, we have some string arrays, and some other arrays, and string builders. And we remember from the, old, from the other one that these are things that naturally show up at the very bottom, because they are actually able to take up more space than, than the classes that you create that only take up the space for, for the links that, or for the pointers that the classes have. So, what we do see here, though, is that this maybe looks a little bit fishy. Like we have this link object. We have 15,000 of them, and they seem to be ending up very low on the stack. So we can then go ahead and, and dump a few of them out and go in and dump um, a single one of them out and grab the address and do GC root. So this is the whole chain. It's the same sort of chain that we saw in the last one, run the statistic, dump out some specific objects, root them, understand why they are sticking around. And in this case, we see that this one is sticking around because it's rooted by something called a finalizer queue. So the finalizer queue is a special queue for objects that have finalizers, so that have destructors. Typically, an object will have a destructor if, if the object needs to release some kind of native um, something native, so maybe a database connection or something like that. But every time it does, it means that when you collect the object, it first gets collected, and then it gets put on this queue to get finalized, so we need to run this finalizer. 
And the finalizer is one thread. So all, everything that needs to be finalized needs to go through this one thread. So if we look at the threads in the process, I'll zoom in like that. Um, we'll see that there is exactly one, one thread that's called a finalizer. So it means that anything that needs to be finalizable is now single threaded. It needs to go through this one thing. Um, if for some reason this takes a long time, or if, um, like if for some reason this is blocked or this is, uh, gets messed up somehow, then you might run into an issue where you're leaking or you're using up a whole lot of memory for objects that could be garbage collected but are still but are just waiting for finalization. In fact, if you run threads and you see something like this where you have a lot of these X's, that means that these are threads that um, where the thread object exists, but they are not actually attached to a thread anymore. So they are probably also waiting for finalization. So this is a very big clue that your finalizer is blocked somehow. And if we go in now and look at um, the thread that was the finalizer, and we can run something called CLR stack. So this is the equivalent of you looking at a stack in Visual Studio, right? So we have the finalizer is calling the destructor of in this case, the link object, and it happens to go into sleep. Obviously, I've artificially created the sleep in here, but you can imagine that this is actually sort of like a problem where it takes a lot of time for it to clean up some native resources. But now this is making everything else that should be garbage collected blocked. Now, one thing that's a little bit funky about this is that if you have a class like this, so you do have a destructor, but the destructor is empty, uh, you still have to go through the finalizer. As soon as you put a destructor on your object, you will need to go through the finalizer, which means that your object will at least survive one collection. So that's a bad thing. If you don't have anything that needs to be sort of cleaned up, don't do this. But again, we went through what's using up the memory, we looked at the statistics, we looked at why it's not going away, and then from there it's obviously a matter of trying to resolve and make sure that uh, the finalizer gets unlocked. Uh, so we used WinDBG, um, we used SOS, so SOS can also be installed with .NET install SOS, but it also comes with uh, the WinDBG version that's in the store. And sometimes you'll also need symbols if you need to know, if you need to look at sort of like the native stacks and everything. And in that case, you might want to install .NET symbols as well. Now with the garbage collector, I'm not going to sort of like go in super, super deep on, on the garbage collector and how it works. But the garbage collector uses something called generations. And this is in order to speed up garbage collection. So we can think about generations like this. Generation zero is very trans transient data, so very temporary data. That's local variables or, or things that are only al alive for like the function or the uh, request or, or whatever it might be. And then as soon as that goes out of scope, it's ready to be collected. So for the garbage collector, because the garbage collector uses uh, generations, it can say that, um, um, so it can sort of like do this thing where um, if we've allocated enough uh, memory that we can't fit in the L2 cache, which is like the, the CPU cache anymore, then we should garbage collect. And if you garbage collect these newly created objects, there is a very big chance that you'll actually be able to garbage collect a lot of that memory. Um, so then, once you've garbage collected that, if for some reason it is rooted, like in this case, like if you write a lot of post-it notes and, and, um, and your table where you can put the post-it notes is done, then if something is still in use, then it will then move into generation one. And eventually, we'll have a generation one collection when the segment is full or when, when the budget for generation one happens. And then whatever is still in use then, we'll go into generation two. And hopefully generation two, we won't have to garbage collect that often because these are long-lived things like K 
cache or, or statics or things that are meant to be there maybe for the entirety of the process. And we don't want to worry about like having to garbage collect them all the time. So by doing this, we can speed up the garbage collection quite a bit. Apart from the generations, we also have sort of like the elephant in the room, which is the large object heap. So large object heap is a special generation, which actually turns out to be sort of generation three, where all the large objects are. Large objects being anything that's over 85,000 bytes in size. So strings, arrays, things like that that happen to be very big. Now, the reason why we put them in a separate one is because they are very expensive to move around. Like moving around in a very large array is a lot of churn for, our, for the garbage collector. So we want to keep that separate. But there are issues that you can run into where you overexhaust the large object heap. So you, use, you allocate a lot of large objects because every time a large object segment is full, we have to do a full like a full garbage collection. Large objects, generation two, generation one, generation zero, everything. So you don't want to end up in that situation. Which brings us to bad performance. Um, so we're going to look at a situation where we have very high CPU and garbage collection. Um, when we look at performance issues, we also have very, two very simple questions to answer. One is, what is it that we're doing, and why is it taking so long? Like, essentially, how can we reduce um, the amount of time that, or the amount of, of energy we're spending on, on whatever we're doing? So we're going to have a look at one, which is a high CPU and garbage collection running on Azure. So in this case, um, we can't really use .NET uh, dump or anything, because this is a web application running on Azure. But one thing we can do, though, um, in web apps is if we go, in, go into this diagnose and solve problems bit in Azure. I don't know how many people run web apps in Azure. Uh, quite a few. OK, so hopefully you're a little bit familiar with this. So um, if you have either a memory issue or a crash or something like that um, in your application running on Azure, you can run this tool, um, and specifically the diagnostic tools. So in the diagnostic tools, you're allowed to, like you can get traces, or you can collect memory dumps. Uh, you can monitor for crashes and ask it to create, to create memory dumps on a crash or or on a certain performance issue or something. We're actually going to go in and, and choose collect memory dump. What this does under the hood is it uses this tool, which is called debug diag. So you can download this tool also locally for your own machine if you want to troubleshoot issues on your own machine. And this is a tool that we created also when I worked back in support in order to be able to capture memory dumps for very specific things. So here you can set up rules, for example, so that when it crashes, it will create a dump, or when you're throwing a specific .NET exception, you can create a dump, or when you, um, um, if, you're, if you're over a certain CPU th threshold or whatnot. And once you've captured the dump, you can also run the other part of debug diag, which is the analysis bit. So the analysis bit in this case will run through a specific set of commands and things that we, we saw ourselves sort of like doing over and over and over again. So we created scripts for them. So this will run a, a set of commands that will hopefully identify sort of like the most, the 80% most common issues. So you don't actually have to learn all the commands to, to troubleshoot these kind of things. So in order to do this, then in Azure, you would then either collect data, which is collect a memory dump, or collect and analyze data, which will also run the analysis part. I'm not going to do this because it takes um, quite a while. So instead, I'm going to go ahead and, and just open up an analysis from that I took earlier. And it looks like this. Um, so once you run the analysis, you will get um, sort of like this summary of what the script thought it um, the problem or what, what problems you were running into. So in this case, it thinks that, um, well, it says all of these threads in the process are trying to uh, concatenate strings. And this, in turn, is a common issue that we see that is um, 
um, than discussed in, in these um, blogs or these blog posts. And these blog posts actually go back to um, uh, my blog um, and to, to some of the, uh, some of the uh, posts in there to explain exactly how to troubleshoot them. It also gives some other things like how much CPU usage and things like that. And then you can also go in and, and uh, scroll down and look at what the stacks are and things like that. So without even opening up WinDBG, you can already sort of like go in and, and troubleshoot these issues straight off, um, straight off the process or straight off Azure. Um, so what this particular case is about um, is about um, concatenating very large strings. So let's have a look at um, here um, how string uh, creation works. So let's say we have a string hello, and these are um, this is a segment where, where the red parts are objects that are already on the heap. Now we create a new string hello that gets on the heap. Now we go in and some, someone else allocated something else and then we add on world to, to this string. So mentally we might think that we're just gonna expand the string, but unfortunately um, strings in, in .NET are immutable. And the reason for this is exactly what you see on the screen. Because we can't necessarily expand the object on, on the heap because there might already be something else after it. So instead, you now have to create a new string that contains both hello and world, right? So we've created two strings. And if we were to create, uh, if we were to tack on just one character, we would have to create an entirely new string. So we allocate a lot if we go through, for example, a loop and add just um, one or two characters each time. And if this string happens to be a large string, so something that's over 85,000 bytes, let's say you're building up a full web page, for example, like the, the HTML for, for a complete web page, then you might run into a situation where you tightly create a lot of large objects. And when you create these large objects, you then exhaust the large object segments and create this um, constant garbage collection where you, gar where you garbage collect the full .NET heap, and you end up with super high CPU in, in a garbage collection. So this is a very common uh, problem for if you see high CPU in GC. The solution to this, and, and I'm sure a lot of you have run into this and a lot of you have seen sort of like this problem and this uh, solution, but the solution to this is to use something like a string builder that will allocate um, sort of a buffer for you that you can fill in because then, um, well, first it will allocate a small buffer and then it will gradually double in size. So you don't have to constantly create a new one, you can just fill up the buffer that you've already allocated. So and that's a little bit debugging with a debug diag or um, Azure Diagnostics, which is essentially the same thing. It just happens to be that that tool is running on the, in the cloud. Let's have a look, though, of another way of troubleshooting something like a performance issue. So in this case, it doesn't really matter if the memory dump is gathered from Azure or from locally or wherever you gather it. But in this case, I'm going to grab a memory dump um, that I created earlier, and I'm going to open it up in, in Visual Studio. So um, let's see. Because Visual Studio can also understand uh, .NET memory dumps. And when you open up a memory dump in Visual Studio, and I'm sorry this is uh, a little bit small, but it will tell you pretty much the same thing that you can see from EU version, like what version of the framework you're running, um, like what bitness, a couple of things like that. And you can then go in and choose to either debug only the .NET part, which is um, debug with managed only, or mixed or native only. In this case, we're just going to go ahead and debug with managed. And now, because this is a snapshot, we can't move forward, so we can't step-by-step -step debug, but we can at least see what was going on in the process at the time that, that we captured the dump. So we're going to go in and uh, choose uh, view parallel stacks. 
so view parallel stacks is a tool that you can use also when you're F5 debugging, um, which will show you the, the stacks in the process, um, all of the threads at the same time. So not only the thread, like the active thread that you're debugging. So this is totally usable also like for a step-by-step -step debugging. In this case, it tells us that we have, well, if I zoom out a little bit, um, I have two sort of like console logger and, and something else, but then I have 10 threads that are all in the same stack, which is this product controller featured function, that then goes in and calls this late data layer get featured products. Nine of these are waiting on a lock, and one of them is in a thread sleep. If we go through, so by the way, if you don't have symbols or anything, already here, this should tell you a little bit, like this should give you enough information to go in and look at your code and say, okay, so what the heck is going on here? Why is this thread sleeping? Or why is this uh, thing taking so long or whatnot? But if you do have symbols and if you do have the code for this, you can also go in and click on it and it will take you straight to the, um, to the actual code for the problem. So it will tell you, tell you exactly sort of what's going on. So this is a quite nice debugging experience, I think, going from memory dumps without having to know all these, uh, you know, CLR stack and uh, whatever all these commands are, instead, instead debugging it in, in Visual Studio. So I like this quite a bit. Um, but this works best if you have, uh, if you have the code lined up um, if you don't have the code, you can still go in and look at the call stack, and obviously this will be the call stack similarly to, to what you would see when you, when you step-by-step -step debug. And you can go in and look at locals, and you can look at all sorts of things here. So this was just opening up... Uh, hello? <laughs> so this was just opening up the memory dump inside Visual Studio and using parallel stacks. Right. Um, I put proc dump in here, and because <laughs> at one point I thought I was going to do the demo with proc dump. Proc dump is another tool from Sys Internals that also allows you to capture memory dumps. Um, so go ahead and look that up too. And that's a command line tool if you're doing um, .NET framework and you don't. So you don't have the option of doing a .NET dump. You can then use proc dump, for example, to capture memory dumps. I'm going to end off with. Uh, crashes and exceptions, and I just have a very quick demo of how to troubleshoot such a tool. But one thing about crashes is that crashes are a little bit different than, uh, for example, both memory leaks and performance problems, where normally when you create and when you have a memory leak or a performance problem, you will capture a dump exactly now. So you will type, for example, .NET dump collect, and capture it exactly now. But in the case of a crash, you don't want to do that. You want to wait for the exception or for the crash to happen and then capture the dump. So it's just a little bit different in the way you capture the memory dump. Um, and the thing you want to answer is, of course, uh, what the heck is happening? So one way that you can capture the dump uh, at a time it crashes, and this works both for um, for a crash that happens after some while or, or a crash that happens on startup for, for a product is you can use this Windows error reporting where Windows error reporting will then capture dumps for you of all the processes when they crash and you save them away. You can also go through and, for example, with debug diag or, or with proc dump set up different conditions for when you capture the dump. Um, so I want to show you how a dump debug um, of a crash would look instead. So let's go ahead and close this. And in this case, I've captured a memory dump with uh, when a crash happened. And we're going to do the same thing. Uh, we're going to do debug with managed only. And the difference is because it was captured exactly when the problem occurs, we're taking straight into the action. We don't have to look at the, the parallel stacks. Instead, we're sort of like brought right into 
um, your code if it's lined up or call stack if it's not lined up. You can still use the call stack. And in this case, we can see that the reason why, why this process crashed was because of a null reference exception. So even though you can't step-by-step -step debug, you can still sort of like get nice, cozy experience that you're used to in, in Visual Studio from, from doing step-by-step -step debugging. So hopefully, if you get nothing else from this, just opening up memory dumps in, in Visual Studio should be fairly comfortable for you. So all of this and more in labs and labs and everything you can want is, is on my blog. And I'm on Twitter if you want to contact me. It's Tess Ferrandes there too. Um, but with that, I, am, I don't have any more content, but I'm, I have a few minutes for questions if you have any. Yes? Uh, are there any distinct advantages of using like, the .NET CLI compared to uh, like, uh, .memory and .trace to So the question is, is there any distinct advantages of using .NET uh, GC dump, for example, yeah. versus JetBrains um, and JetBrains uh, memory tools and things like that. I would say not much. It's more what you're comfortable with. If you're comfortable with JetBrains, then by all means use JetBrains because that's they are very good tools for for these kind of things too. Yes. And so another tool that's mentioned is Perfu and based on ETW. Yeah, it should, it will still work in, in .NET Core. I just didn't find necessarily a use for it here. That's more sort of like when you, when you want to see a couple of events that have happened and you want to trace sort of like maybe time travel debugging or maybe going back sort of like to, to what has happened in the past to lead up to the problem. So that is certainly also a tool that that is very usable for these kind of things. Maybe more for for the perf cases than maybe the memory ones, but yeah. I just didn't have a, a use case for it here, but. Okay, yes. Sorry, I, I need to listen more <laughs> because the. Do these tools work with WebAssembly? Web um, good question. Um, I am not entirely sure, but let's talk with Steve Sanders and, and, and ask, because um, I think they might. But I'm not entirely sure, so I can't answer. OK, well, I'll be here for a while. So thank you so much for, for um, uh, indulging me and staying with me for this last hour and go out and have, have a good party. So thank you.